Okay, guys, welcome back to the podcast. Today's guest sitting down with us is Coach Taylor. He is the head football coach at North Surrey High School. Did I get the right high school? Mm -hmm, that's right. Yeah, I wrote it down. I was like, I hope that's the right one. Figure it out. Uh, coach, thanks for coming on the podcast with me today, my lonely podcast here. Man, I appreciate it. It's, uh, it's an honor to be on it. It's always good to talk ball and find out how football is different in different areas and things of that nature. So it's an honor to be on. Yeah, uh, or lack of football. We, we don't know, but uh, we haven't had football. I haven't done anything football since October. Like, we haven't seen the kids since October. Yeah, Zoom a little bit, but not since October. Wow. Wow. See, that's, and we've been going since we've been having, like I said, conditioning practice and uh, things of that nature since July um two days a week you could do you could do and you know other sports couldn't overlap so you had to kind of pick a way to, to get all the multi-sport athletes to different places but um we've been fortunate enough to do that um and we played in the independent um seven on seven league from september to about the first of november we played on friday nights and it had strict guidelines and things um, for distance and stuff, but at least got us out doing some things uh, where we could throw the ball and play a little bit of defense um, and get the kids involved. And, you know, we're we're set to start official practice in about three weeks and play fe February 20, 26th will be the first first game. Yeah, we we had contact days in October. My school, we went two and a half weeks and then we got shut down because the numbers went up in the yeah. area and then and then it comes down onto the districts so like if you were allowed to have contact days if your district says no you don't so where my school was located at was like a hot spot it was the highest in the county so they said no which i'm not gonna argue with them like it, it, they're trying to be safe but then there's some just there's some schools here that are throwing the football around and i'm not gonna get them in trouble they're not supposed to but that's what they're doing but they're out there doing this doing that but yeah, like we've been remote since the start. Uh, I haven't seen the football kids since October, besides Zoom. And I'm new. I took this offensive line run coordinator job in June. So for me, it's almost worse because I'm like, I don't know these kids at all. Like the other coaches yeah. have been there, so they know the names. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know this kid's name. Yeah, I would say that I'd say that would be tough. I know a couple of guys that got hired in the summertime for new jobs as head coaches and they haven't seen they haven't been able to see or uh or really do anything with their kids and really get a handle on them, much less, you know, in a weight room situation, even getting to know them. Uh sometimes that you can get a conversation and kind of get another kid in that situation. But um it's it's going to be um it's going to be interesting, you know, and 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 to see how it it plays out and um and so on and so forth and and to, you know with with the restrictions being able to just get to play um is great uh, because in my 19 years of coaching I never thought I would I haven't had to but I never thought I'd have to make a speech to seniors um that your senior season is canceled and that would that I mean that would be tough for any for any coach to do. I know, you know, our baseball season got canceled last year, like two or three games into the season. And to have to say, you know, guys, we got to shut it down. Um, that, that's tough for a kid because, you know, we, we all know we coach a lot of kids that once they take off the whatever athletic equipment they have as a senior for the, for most of them, it's the last time they will ever do it. Um, and from the team aspect of it, um, you know, you really don't ever get, get the camaraderie of a team, uh, the, for the rest of your life for that many people gathered. So, you know, it, it's definitely heartbreaking um, uh, to have to give some type of speech like that, if that was to ever come and, and everything. And I'm, I'm glad. And I know we're fortunate in North Carolina to be able to play uh, or be scheduled to play in February. Um, it's going to be a little colder um, than we're used to. Uh, but you know, you have to adapt and overcome. We tell our kids that all the time, but you know, I'm, I feel fortunate that we're going to get to play and at least have a conference season with playoffs. Um, and so they're going to, they're going to put our season in seven weeks 
you play seven straight weeks and then you go straight into the playoffs and, um, and play that and it overlaps some with baseball um, and wrestling and uh, basketball overlaps a week um, with football. But, you know, it's uh, it was I- I'm looking forward to it to get around the kids. This is my longest, uh, like you said, November. The f- second week of November is the last time we had pads on and done anything 11 on 11 or even ran plays really um, with a full with a full. Uh, 22 and uh it's been the longest in my career being away from that and and i can tell you i myself have had withdrawals because of it you know and it's it's a big part of your life and the kids are a big part of your life and when all this came about you know um it's been a definite adjustment in some ways it's been good we spent a lot of time retooling stuff in the coach's office um and we're anxious to put it you know put it into play or see how it goes into play yeah when when they told us February <clears throat> February fifteenth, <clears throat> um, I live up in the suburbs of Chicago now for two and a half years. When they told us February fifteenth, we we're like, you know what happens in Illinois and in Chicago February fifteenth? We have snow and ice. Yeah. So the yeah. first thing we did in October, the head coach was actually brilliant. Like, we don't overlook special teams. He was like, but we need to do a ton of special teams. And I said, why? He goes. Imagine them trying to snap the ball and kicking the ball in February. Yeah, be tough. That was a good, that was a good point. Because <clears throat> luckily we have turf. But <clears throat> something, guys, I ate chips before this, so I apologize. It's just happening. But like we have a turf, and I'm like, well, the turf is frozen. And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah. So we just, we spent a ton of time kicking and snapping. Yeah. And then I started telling my coaching buddies around Illinois, and they go, we didn't think of that. Because, you know, you only spend so much time on special teams, you split it up. They're like, <clears throat> we didn't think of that. So they just start going all over doing special teams. So, and then we had to order gear. We were like, we're going to be freezing. Yeah. And then the kids were like, but that's fine, coach. Like, they just wanted to play. They don't yeah. Care. Um, but like you said, it, at least you guys got to do some things with football. Like, I'm, I was losing my mind, like in a football season, I'm watching film on Saturdays. You know, you got the laptop open, you're watching film, and I have college going on, but I'm just watching it as a fan because I'm focusing on the next game. And you steal nuggets, you know, from certain teams you watch. This year, every college game I was on, I was watching, like, football. I was watching offensive line play. I was watching quarterback play. And I'm like, Steve, you have a problem because now you're, t- you're you're watching this like your own film. Yep. Like, yeah, I was the same way. Uh, because we're in Big Ten countries, so I was trying to watch, and I was one of the guys that said Ohio State shouldn't be in the playoff because I watched it like actual film. And I was like, their weaknesses are their corners and safeties, and they're like, how do you know that? And I was like, because when I watch them, I'm watching. I was like, oh, wait a minute. I'm watching film. Like, I figured out their weaknesses, and I was like, they shouldn't be in there. Look at this. Look at that. (laughs) And they're like, Steve, you have a problem. You have a real problem. Yeah, it was a habit to do that because I didn't I didn't have a lot of film to watch. We had no film to watch other than last year's and we'd already broke all that down and and I would watch I would catch myself watching the games and and I would watch it more as a player than a, I mean a coach than as a fan and and it definitely, you know, I got to where I would I'd end up just watching maybe one or two games a weekend because I would end up, you know, I'm sitting here breaking it down as I watch it instead of just watching it as a as a fan and enjoying it. Yeah, me and my two friends from growing up, every Sunday we do like a live YouTube and we talk about sports, which is why I wanted the podcast to do. But then I turned it to talking to coaches, but we do that on Sundays. So we pick like five games. So I have a laptop going, the TV going, the tablet going, my phone going. I have these games. <laughs> and I'm trying to watch them just to recap them. But then it turned, like you said, I turned into like, let me just draw this up and what they're doing. <clears throat> um <clears throat> what's their weakness? What do they do? Oh, and that's where like, if you saw me, I look crazy. All this stuff, go all these, like Pat McAfee, he shares his screen. He has all these TVs. That's what it looked like. Yeah. And I'm like, Oh, I need to, this is my life. But I was like, I need to do so. I need to go outside. Yeah. Like, I need to go take a walk. Yeah. Um, so people that may never have heard you talk or look at your stuff, um, I've watched your stuff, your stuff and Coach Mackey, you've been on Coach Mackey's stuff. You 
are you still big in the air raid stuff? Because I like that stuff. So are you still big in the air raid? Is that what you still do or you're going to do in the spring? Yeah, I, we're not going we're not going to change uh, very much. Um, we might use some different type of personnel um, in it. Um, but that's kind of, I know everybody talks about the blue in the face and they're really interested in the plays. Um, the way you practice it and the, and the adaptability of it year to year makes it, makes it so easy, um, to, to transition from year to year and types of players and, and that nature. Some years you might run more of this than that. It it really, it really kind of kind of glues itself to almost like a true old triple option team to where, you know, you've got inside veer, outside veer, trap options, stuff like that. And some years you might run this, uh, you might be more of an inside veer team and some years you might be an outside veer team and so on and so forth. And uh, you might can throw it a little more because your quarterback skill set. And that's kind of the way the air rate is. We don't have to completely retool everything we do mainly the thing we do in the off season is we do exactly what you talked about. You know, where are our weaknesses? Um, what are we good at? What is this kid good at in the offense? You know, collectively, what are we good at in the offense? And let's get really good at that and, and roll with it. And, you know, how can we adapt some things? You know, this year we saw more of the, the Iowa state tight front, you know, and we saw a lot of that um, probably from week five on, we saw that every week. And so, you know, yeah, you know, first game, it slows you down just a little bit. And by the end of the year, uh, you know, it was just like seeing a different defense. I mean, the same defense each week. And you kind of, you know, figure out, you know, this is what we got to stick with. And our playbook shrinks. And I, I'll say this, the more our playbook shrinks, the, the better off I feel. Um, if we can do if we can do everything in the air rate, I'm glad. If we're really, really good at four or five things, I I go into a game pretty confident because we can adjust very easily and tag stuff so easily that that um, it it makes it very user friendly and the ad- adaptation of it year to year makes it very user friendly for a high school. Yeah, like I just say spread. Like I know that's not the right thing because I had a talk with Coach Mac and we were like, he's like, how do you define spread? And we had that whole conversation, like. So once you bring a hand down tight end, are you considered spread still, even though you're in shotgun? So it was just a good conversation. I was like, oh, you're right. I didn't think of that. Um, so when I say spread to people, I'm like, I want my quarterback in shotgun. I want more wide receivers. But I'd rather incorpor- install it like a Mike Leach way of those formations. And then if you come in, in my world, if you have a kid that can be a hand down tight end, you can yep. easily adjust that. And guess what? You've had another gap for zone. Yep. And he can still run stick and he can still maybe do Y if he's athletic enough and you are lucky, maybe he can do Y cross. He just sneaks out. Yep. And, and that's why I like, I'd rather be spread and have to bring them in like a tight end or an H back instead of being like a wing, no offense to wing T teams. I don't want to start that bubble or first that or anything. Yeah. But I'd rather bring them in than rather start of a start out as a wing T and then be like, Oh my goodness, I have a kid that can sling it. And I got some speed. Let's spread it out. I feel like that'd be harder to do. Yeah, it, and that's that is the truth. I mean, you know, you see so many you see so many variations of it now, um, with the core plays still in place. But you see so many different personnel groupings now um, with it, and it just keeps expanding. But it's really not changing. It's just changing the the I say the chess pieces on the board, like you said. You know, if we get a big run of tight end type kids. Well, we don't have to abandon what we're doing in the offense. Um, we can actually create, like you said, putting that tight end on the line. Well, the defense now has to decide, are they going to declare true seven or maybe seven and a half, eight in the box? Or are they going to, you know, stay in a true, you know, quarters look and and give you that, give you that soft edge for that tight end? Now your running game is is explosive. And, you know, once you get your running game going, you know, the, the passing game becomes easy. And just like if you pass the ball, well, the running game becomes pretty easy because you, you got to make them, you got to make them take away one and give you the other, and you got to be good at whatever they, they give you. And that's, that's the thing that, you know, our success, we have done it in 10 personnel. We've done it with an H back. 
um, done it with a, I've done it in double tights, like a, a true, like a set, um, I, you know, in my career. And it's just been, it's been very, very handy because we don't have to go. Okay. Um, we're a spread to run a power spread team. Well, I don't have a running quarterback this year. And so, you know, that kind of kills that whole aspect of if, if you're spread to run team and, and you don't have a running quarterback, it's not going to bode well for you, especially if you can't throw the ball. Mm-hmm. And so if, if we, if we have a running quarterback, we don't have to change anything. We just tag the runs for the quarterback. It's the same, the offensive line is blocking the same thing. And if we, if we have more of a pro style quarterback, then, we don't have to retool the running game either. We just don't tag him in the runs and so on and so forth. And if we want to go two back, you're just launching your route from a different position. You know, it's not, we don't have to, if we got two good running backs, well, we can go two back gun and do, and do basically everything. And I think that's one thing people, we know what we see and, and studying this offense since 90, the late nineties, uh, I, I remember seeing some tight end sets. I, you know, I remember there being some I formation sets in it in the in the early years um, of it, especially in tight yarded situations and them throwing wide corner and stuff. And so it is so adaptable. The passing game lends itself for easy reads, and it's so adaptable that in high school it just works so well. Yeah, because I remember, I think you've been coaching longer than me, but when I was getting into coaching. When I played, we ran the power eye option, like old school. Yeah, that's all I, that's all I knew. And then when I was getting to more, I started coaching. I was eighteen, so when I was starting to do it, the spread was like the forbidden fruit you weren't supposed to touch because we were under center option. And yeah, I went to learn it, and one of the first things I remember, air raid's complicated. That's what I, I heard. Run and shoot, air yeah. raid was complicated. Those, those two are the things. Now, run and shoot, yes, that that one. Yeah. Because there's not a lot to find. I talked to Coach Clark about it. And I was like, are you going to lose your man card if you talk to me about the run and shoot? <laughs> because yeah. you can't find it. No. He's like, no, I'm, I won't lose it. I just can't tell you pass protection. That's what I just can't yeah. tell you. They're secretive about that pass protection. Yeah. I was like, he's like, I can't tell you that, but I can tell you what we do. Is he, you know, if, he's you, if you watch it long enough, you can figure the pass protection out. Yeah. I, I was like, I hopefully I can figure it out. I just want to know more about everything else. And then when I finally learn or look at the air raid, I was like, this isn't complicated. No. Like you can tag routes, but when you go from this formation to this formation and you call it the same exact play, it looks it'll look different because of the formation, but it's the same thing for the receivers. Yeah. And I said, What's this isn't complicated? So like why do you think the air raid got a rap of like this is complicated? Well, I th- I think because you know like you were saying, um, I, I grew up in middle Georgia and I grew, I grew up playing in the straight T offense. And the mm-hmm. first offense I learned was the wing T offense. Mm-hmm. And those are great prolific offense. And there is nothing prettier. You're talking about the power option. There is nothing prettier than a team that can run those offenses because they are a series offense and they're tough. And if, if, if the fakes are good and the motions are tight and the timing's right, that is a bear to defend. And it is tough, and and I love to watch coaches that coach those offenses and are really good at it. Um, but the passing game scared people, um, not defensively. They scared it in teaching because, you know, well, I, I got these guys running routes, and the number one thing that I think early on that they got the bad rap from, they were scared to death of of, of five man protection, and that you know early on you seven man protected. Well, that left you with maybe, you know, three guys getting in a route and you never released it back. And right. And and that scared a lot of coaches. Well, high school guys can't protect, you know, with five guys. And and I think that it was just a comfort zone thing that gave it a bad rap um, and made it seem complicated. And you see all these guys running routes. And how do you teach the quarterback to read those routes in high school? Can he really read a triangle? And can he? can you do all this? And and when it boiled down to it, you know, it, when you really boil it down, it is, it is a simple offense, but it's just like the option and the fact that it is labor intensive. And the other thing is, is, you know, people, 
people in in makeshift I say makeshift offenses when you see an offense running that doesn't really have an identity and they have a lot of formations and they have a lot of plays but I call them what the wing T is great about is those constraint plays you know you know the trap off buck sweep and and you know the 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 crisscross and the counters off your motion and stuff like that those are you know you catch somebody overflowing or and and they're flying out on sweep where you're going to trap them up the middle and, and so on and so forth get your eyes in the backfield we're going to do this to you you know understanding that and seeing offenses that don't take that into account um you start looking at okay if you've got a bunch of plays and you've got a bunch of formations that doesn't really scare me when I used to break down film as a defensive coordinator. If you were really good at running two or three, if you ran power on offense and you ran power a hundred different ways and you were constantly moving the chess pieces to, to make me adjust and, and try to overcompensate and so on and so forth, then I was more worried about you. But, you know, teams don't see that, you know, if you practice it like the option to where you're going to do, you're going to do uh dive keep pitch drill every day you're going to uh you're going to work the read drill every day you're going to do the veer blocking drill every day every day the practice is the same Mm -hmm. and if you do that and you're good at it i think that's where teams that run those type of offenses in high stress situations they're okay because the adjustments are minimal to get an advantage versus I mean, everyone else has been in a situation on the sideline. You're trying to draw up a new play in a, you know, a timeout, and you're hoping that 11 high schoolers who five of them are looking at their mom, a couple of them looking for their girlfriend, you hope they just got everything. You might have the most brilliant play drawn up that's going to absolutely score a touchdown, and you got to hope that their attention span hung with you long enough to execute it. Plus, the guy on the other sideline coming out of the timeout isn't going to move things around. And so that's what I love about it, that if you get into formations, you know how people are going to play you. It's easy for the quarterback to recognize what's going on. It's easy for a lineman to, you know, recognize, you know, the fronts are going to get. And so you really narrow it down to what's the most important thing is execution. Did we execute tonight or not? And that's when you look at football now, you know, watching the national championship game, as dominant as Alabama is, you don't hear Nick Saban talking about points per game anymore as far as his defense. It, he's looking at points per possession they score versus points per possession they give up. Because at the end of the day, that's how you – and I know that leads to the ultimate points per game scoreboard. Mm-hmm. But, you know, looking looking at it and breaking it down like that, you're looking at execution. Well, we got the ball with a chance to score. Did we execute? No. And, you know, we had to punt. Well, we gave them an extra possession because – you start looking at that more so, it all boils back down to practice. What can you do in the two, two and a half hours that you got every day and be really good at it and be able to practice it three or four times a week to get ready for the game? Uh, you know, offenses have been the single wing. We, I mean, we go back to guys that's run the single wing. They run the same stuff over and over and over again. They know the adjustments and and they and their kids are confident in those adjustments and it, it wreaks havoc. So, you know, I think what – I think what you have to look at is that they didn't understand how to practice it. They looked at it as a wide open throwing gimmick offense. And I think they really didn't think it would stay around very long. And, you know, you know, it has, and you're seeing a lot of it in the NFL now. Mm-hmm. I mean, you pieces of it. Nobody runs the outright air raid in the NFL, but you're seeing a lot of those kinds of concepts, you know, in the NFL. Yeah. No one talks about, we've all seen the Twitter wars of like triple option wing T versus spread air raid. And it's funny. Could you triple option guys? I've talked to a couple who are good, you know, like they talk good about air raid. They talk good about theirs. You see, it's funny. You brought that up. They talk about triple option. You have to practice this over and over and over and over again. Well, if you're an air raid team, you do the same. You're just throwing it. Yeah. Like it, it's the coach. Steve show is sponsored by the launch pad kickoff tee. If you're a football coach out there, high school, college, NFL, doesn't matter. And you're looking for that edge for your special teams, for your kicker, for the kickoff on sides. You guys need to go to launchpadkickofftee.com. If you have a younger guy trying to develop the kicker, you want the ball to get to the end zone, you need to go to Launchpad Kickoff Tee. This tee gives a coach a strategic options for squib kicks, on sides, everything. It is proven that your kicker will kick off farther. It is legal for NCAA, for high school, okay? 
The Launchpad Kickoff Tee is a game changer. So if you go to launchpadkickofftee.com slash CSS to use the code CSS, you can get a Launchpad Kickoff Tee for 10% off. So go to launchpadkickofftee.com slash CSS. You can use the code CSS for the Coach Steve Show to get 10% off. Also, there's a bundle. You can get one for 10% off. You can go to two and get more percent off. Or there's an option to buy four. If you click the option to buy the four kickoff tees, if you like it so much, when you use the code CSS, you'll get the fourth one free. So instead of paying full price for all four, you'll get three. So go to launchpadkickofftee.com slash CSS. Use the code CSS. Get 10% off. Buy four to get the fourth one free. This is a game changer, guys. It does more than just hold your balls. Go get the Launchpad Kickoff Tee today to give your kicker an edge for next season. Are you guys tired of overpaying for your cable? Do you think, oh, I need to go to the streaming side so I can save some money? Are you tired of taking out a small loan to pay for the cable just to watch things? There's so many streaming services. Do you not know or have a hard time pick which streaming service? Lucky for you, the Coach Steve Show, which is on the Unhinged Sports Network, have a proud partnership with Fubo TV. Fubo TV has over 100 plus channels. They have NBC, CBS, Fox, ABC, ESPN, much more without the hassle of that cable contract. If you don't believe me, go to the link in the bio. You can get a seven day free trial today. So if you click on the link in the bio of the episode, you can get a free seven day trial to support the Unhedged Sports Network, to support the Coach Steve Show podcast. Please use that link. Guys, it's time to cut the cord. Streaming services is where it's at. Get the internet, get the streaming service. You can, if you don't like it, get rid of it, but I think you're going to like it. That's why there's a seven day free trial. Cut the cord, quit taking out small loans to pay for this cable network. Please don't let these cable people trick you into getting into a three year contract, two year contract, and raising your rates. Go to Fubo TV, best way to watch all the sports, any shows that you watch. So please support the show. Go click on the link now. Try it out for seven days free. Cut the cord. Yes. Like it, it's, and you correct me if I'm wrong, like, because I know you've, you know, talked to how mommy and Coach Leach, and you correct me. They kind of took that if then concept from those guys and like, how can we incorporate an if then situation in an air raid or their passing? Like, run a mesh for a while and then, oh, we're on shallow or tag a post on behind it. Like, if then they took those concepts and just made it throwing it like it's the same. You're practicing over and over. We have the if then thing. If they run, if wing T, if you run power and they come in, run buck sweep. Same thing. It, it, it's it's funny you say that because like if you look at probably the three most explosive offenses in college football over the last 50 years, I'm going to go to the wishbone from the days of Oklahoma. I mean, Barry Switzer was putting up crazy numbers with the wishbone um, and, and other teams. You know, I remember Nebraska running the triple option and the crazy numbers they were putting up, both, you know, suited in triple option. And then you look at the run and shoot guys. I mean, they've, they've put up in the 80s and 90s, um, they put up crazy numbers and the air raids put up crazy numbers. And when you look at it, the thing that they all have in common, they practice the same. And, mm-hmm. and it is the if then principle. When I talk to my quarterbacks, when we talk about reads, it's it's if then it's if then, you know, and, you know, check the vertical and throw opposite of the flat player. It gets back to no different than the guys we're talking about that didn't like it when they used to line up and run slant flat. Well, you throw off the flat defender. If he goes out, you throw the slant. If he hangs on the slant, you throw the flat. It, it goes back to, you know, can you teach a vertical with a curl flat? On most concepts, well, yes, you can, and a quarterback can do that. And but I think the way of it was going to have to you have to restructure practice. And if you weren't an option guy, you really didn't take that into account that we're going to do the same thing every day because this is what we base everything around. It's timing, you know, it's recognition and it's execution. And that's the thing. The labor of it, people are like, well, you got to throw the ball so much. I'll say this, Steve Spurrier. I remember reading years ago. He said, if you're going to throw the football, you have to practice it three times as much as a run game in practice to be good at it. 
Mm-hmm. And, and we're talking about a, a really good college college football coach, and he, he won a lot of games with some really good players. But, you know, even he had a more of a run-oriented style, you know, fun and gun. But he still understood that whatever you do the most of, you've got to do it the most and be really, really good at it. And, you know, that's to say, um, you know, last year was the first year we hadn't rushed for 2,000 yards as a team. And so a lot of people automatically think, too, well, if you're going to throw the ball that much, you can't run the football. And and that's that's really – that's false. You know, I, I don't really – if a team is better than you, they're better than you. But if what they can do is run the football, sooner or later, like every wing tee and every power I team has to have an answer for 10 or 11 in the box, mm-hmm. whatever that is. And if you're not good at that answer, then teams are going to, you know, clamp down on you. Or when you finally play a team that's as good as you in a championship situation, then you better, you know, you better have that answer for that situation or they're going to, they're going to beat you. And that's the whole thing with that. I like about what we do is that it gives us an advantage because we get to rep it more. And you have kids coming to the sideline talking about the game inside the game. And, and that tells you that their process and what you're teaching at practice. And that's probably, you know, one of the things I think in the end that people are slowly seeing that kids can learn a whole lot more than we give them credit for as long as we're able to rep it. Now, are you allowed to say you're running the football in the air raid? Are you going to lose your air raid card for saying? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, and that gets back to me where I'm a little more logical. You know, if you're giving me a run box, we're going to run the football. Right. And and if you're going to, you know, if you're giving me drop eight, well, we're going to we're going to pound the rock. And and if you're, you know, if you're in a six man box, I feel like I can do both. And, you know, if you're in a seven, well, I'm probably going to win more to the past, depending on what type of seven man box you're giving me and where the numbers are. That That's the beauty of it is that, you know, I told you the first offense that I learned, we're more of a gap scheme team. And and. That's the great part about it, too, is that we don't have to change a whole lot with the tailback we got back there, and, and we can gap a lot of teams up and don't have to worry about, uh, you know, practicing a lot of zone combinations. We can still down and kick and pull and lead through, and that, you know, that lends itself to a lot of repetition, too. Yeah, I just wanted to point that out when someone listens to this. Wait a minute, he's running the ball in the air raid? I'm like, well, you're not – we're not idiots. If there's five guys in the box, yes. Zone or power yeah. it just real quick. It's fine. Yeah. Like, yeah. why wouldn't you? And it goes back to the wing T thing. I've asked some wing T coaches, like, well, what do you do? I have two questions always for them. What do you do when you have a kid that comes in that can sling the ball and you've got some speed? Oh, we can run rocket. You know, we can do this. We can do that. I'm like, well, no, wait a minute. How do you do that? And then they're like, well, you know, we'll just do some waggle. We'll do some drop backs. I'm like, okay, now you're getting there. And then I say, what if you do if there's 11 in the box? It, it, in their minds, it just works, works, works. That's the thing when you're throwing the ball. That's why people give Mike Leach a lot of crap because of their record. But I, they kept telling him to change. I'm like, no, this is what he does. This is what he's going to do, and it's going to work. That's what he thinks. He doesn't go into the game thinking it doesn't work. No. And – and the, and the thing about it is, is what you just said. If you go back and read the Tubby Raymond Wing T book from the 60s, if you can find a copy of it, I have a copy of it. Early in the book, he says, if your lone receiver can't beat man coverage with a slant, a fade, or he can't beat he can't beat one-on-one situations, you can't run this offense. Because at some point in time, you're going to have to throw that ball out there to him to make the defense have to play that guy. Because if you just leave him out there all night, they're going to end up saying, well, that's just the 10th guy out there or the 11th guy out there. We really don't have to worry about him. Put our worst defender on him. Take a chance. We're going to say, okay, you're going to run the ball in the box. And and a lot of teams can, and that's great. And and it's a two-part question that you said. You know, uh, you know Mississippi State came out, and they, 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 they played LSU and beat them. And, you know, I, you know, I knew that that was going to be a favorable matchup for them because they got a lot of man coverage. The thing that people don't understand, and I made a Twitter post about this, the beauty of the air raid is this. 
I, there was a lot of people after they kind of went on a streak. I was at the game three when they played Kentucky. I was in person there. And, you know, I knew then that he he was – from a fan standpoint, he had some guys that hadn't bought in, and he had some guys that really didn't understand what they were doing. Well, they didn't get a full summer of practice. That's not making excuses. But this is what I, I want to say. If you watch them each week, and when Real, Will Rogers came in the game and took over full time, um, you watched him a couple of games in, you could see he was getting comfortable with it. He was making the checks. He was starting to run the show. And then you see their tight end start getting a big piece of the, the pie, and they were getting the ball to different people. By the end of the year, if you go back and watch week two and three, and then you watch the last three weeks of the season – completely different football team. And I guarantee you that if you went to practice on day one and day 500, they practice the same way every day. And that's the moment. A lot of coaches would have panicked and said, well, this ain't going to work. This is, you know, this is it. I am sure that, that coach Lee's come back into his office and he's like, this is what we're not good at. This is what we need to practice more. We need to emphasize this more in our drills da, 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 down his list. Um, and to create a better product, you have to, you know, make better production. And that production line is practice. And that's the thing that you can't abandon in anything that you do, you know, suit it to your personnel, but don't abandon what you're doing because you're having a bad game. You better look at what you're doing in practice and what you're demanding in drills. And and that's going to be the finished product that you see on your Thursday night and Friday nights is what you did through Monday through Thursday, everybody's got a play or two that, that you can dial up and catch somebody off guard. I, you know, I, those are always helpful to have in your back pocket, but to have an offense now that doesn't have any shot plays that, that, that buzzword. Well, we don't, you don't have no shot plays built into it and you don't really change anything you do. You just, like you said, make the adjustments, a tag here, a tag there. You know, to say that they can make that type of stride in a shortened season, I can tell you right now, um, before barring injury or any problems, before before that quarterback leaves Mississippi State, he'll break a lot of records because he understands the offense. He's understood where to go with the ball. Um, he's understood his checks. You, you could just see it grow each week. And I was like, guys, next year, um, it's it's going to be even better because more players have bought in. He's going to recruit some more kids, and there's more kids going to come in, and the older kids are going to get better, and it's just refining that process, um, you know, and, and keep going. But you're right. I, you know, when you think about it, you know, the two things is how can you handle the checks that you got to make when a, when a defense takes away what you do and for – you know, for us this year, you were asking, you know, we got that tight box. We were, we were uh, against a really athletic football team under two minutes to go. And I had a couple of timeouts and, and, and they were just hell bent on staying in those two, four eyes and playing that five man box and their secondary, looked like a bumper pool table. And they were more athletic than us. And they were throwing some zone blitzes at us and we had to make a drive to win. Mm-hmm. And it was a drive to win. And, and coach, we ran Q counter seven times on that drive. <laughs> Called timeout. And I'm not making fun of them, but okay, you're going to stop us from throwing the football. Well, we're going to run the greatest run play in football, and that's counter. And we're going to run it and we're going to be patient. And we know what we got to do and the pace we got to go at and the formation we got to be in to get the box the way we want. And I remember on I called timeout with maybe seven or eight seconds left, and I said we got time for one play. It was my last time out. I said we got time for one play. I said I'm gonna give you two plays. I said we're gonna run quarterback counter and we're gonna tag the slants. I said or you can run quarterback counter. I said but it's the same play. I'm gonna tag you some runs off of it. I mean some throws off of it. Um, so in case we threw an incompletion, we'd have another down real quick, but, uh, we got in the game and, uh, they just, they, he, he never even looked, he just took the court, the ball up in the hole and scored and we won. And, but that's how confident we felt about it because our run game, 
we practice it every day. We practice the pass game every day. So when somebody took something away from us, um, you know, we we could still move the football and put ourselves in scoring position. And that's 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 the hat that you got to hang on on whatever you're doing, offensive or defensively. Yeah, that's why I love spread offenses. I'm not saying you need everything in the tool belt, but you you're able to do enough to where like yeah. if they do this, we have the pass. If you do this, we have the run. Yeah. Where I feel like in a wing T, no offense, somebody's gonna listen to this and say, Steve, but I just feel like in a wing T, you're stuck, in my opinion. Yeah. Nothing wrong with it. It's a great offense, but I just feel like if you're down by 20, how do you come back? Now, I know Navy did it this year, which is fantastic, but Navy threw the ball some this year. Yeah. And and lined up in more gun than I've ever seen them do. I've always said that if you could take the the Paul Johnson flex bone, the double slot, triple option, and mix it and get the pass game from the air raid and get it installed – with a quarterback that could really do both, you would eat people alive, especially if you did it with tempo. Hmm. Because you're having to defend basically a run game that's built the same way as the pass game with that if-then principle, and you're already in a lot of the formations, and a lot of the motions are taking you to a trips or a two-by-two formation, plus you're adding a tight end, so they're having to worry about another run gap. And, you know, my question has always been, is there enough time in practice to practice both and be good at them. And I think that's where you run into it. But I've always said, if, if you could get in a flex bone, even if it's in the gun, and going back to like Tony DeMeo when he was at uh, Charleston, if, if you could get into that type of flex bone gun and you're slinging it like the air raid, I would be scared to death of somebody because you've got you've to have option responsibility tagged on every play. And if they drop back to throw the football – you better be able to play pass defense too. So that changes your box count because now that motion and all that stuff shifting. And like you said, option is a whole nother child. And then somebody can really zip the ball. That's a whole nother child. And so I just think it would, I think it would set football on the end if somebody could do that at tempo. You know, it it would, it would be tough. And we always talk about people are getting used to tempo. I don't know if anybody's really used to somebody that can run triple option at a breakneck pace and throw the football down the field. That'd be tough. Yeah, like there's the uh, Rick Stewart stuff. He's got the pistol wing T RPO stuff. That looks dangerous. Then I talked to a coach. He he kind of calls our offense the wing raid, where they install the the, the wing T runs. Yeah, but it has air raid, quick game, and like Y cross on it. And I was like, oh, now you have my interest because if yeah. you can get the buck sweeps going and all that, but you can run the quick game and maybe Y cross and stuff. That's and he goes, yeah. If he said they're they're just set up. He said he ran buck sweep like twelve times in a row. And yeah. my first thing was, my first thing was those poor guards running all yeah. that. But he's like, we were able to do it because the box was set up to our buck sweep, buck sweep. Oh, now we're gonna go buck sweep left. And then once they worried about, it, he goes, oh, I'm gonna run wide corner. And now you gotta stop that. Yep. Um, and I made a joke about COVID. I was like, we're going to see uh, no huddle wing T teams this year because of social distancing. That's what I'm <laughs> waiting for. But yeah. you're right. That's dangerous. If you could do that, if you could just practice the option with your box and have the wide receivers run air rate stuff, I think maybe it could work. Yeah, I wonder if you could do routes on air and have two quarterbacks back there and one of them throwing the ball and the other one's working the option responsibility, and then they flip-flop back and forth so that you would get both in at the same time. I don't know, but I've always said that that would be, that would be very tough to defend because of everything that goes along with it and the counters and everything. It's just it would eat you alive. Yeah, when he, the, the guy told me about his wing raid, he said they don't take a lot of the air raid stuff. It's just like no run mesh. It's just a lot of quick game. Yep. That's about it. Because they more they more focus. You have to pick one. He said that he goes, you gotta pick one. Yeah. Are we coming in to focus on just throwing it? Are we coming in to work on the run? And he goes, I want to do the run. But I want to be able to have the ability to line up in two by two, three by one, and do this. Yeah. And that's, that's actually even that in itself without the option is very dangerous. Yeah, it is. If you can incorporate that and the kids know what's going on, you have the package right, it works. Yep. Yep. Um yeah, it- it would be nasty. But if I post on Twitter, I'm wrong. Let's yeah. Yeah. It makes it, I mean, it would be, it would be tough, but it would be fun. 
that's that's I tell people social media is great if you use it the right way. And I try yes. to use it the right way. I try to use it to do the podcast, try to use it to learn and steal things. Then when I see the conversations of how soft air raid teams are and wing T this and that, and I'm like, ooh, I need to stay away because I'll say something stupid. Yeah. It, yeah. I don't get it. I don't get why it's let's attack well, the yeah. air raid and they're soft. I think it's a I think it's I think sometimes it's a maturity thing to to like we were talking about earlier. I don't really care what offense I'm watching. If it's ran beautifully and even defense, if it's ran beautifully and it's on time and, and everything is, is pinpoint accurate and crisp, I, I don't care what I'm watching. I don't care. Like I said, if I'm watching a straight T team or a five wide, you know, run and shoot team because, you know, somebody's hanging their hat on them and teaching, teaching it with discipline and things. It's, it's fun to watch. And it's a beauty, but being able to respect that, you know, a lot of people ask me about going to the area, you know, I always say, what do you like to do? You know, what, what, what is your passion? What are your beliefs in football? You know, and that's kind of what you have to hang your hat on because you're going to be interested more in what you like to do. Find ways to do that with your athletes that you have and enjoy it. And, and don't worry about the stat, the fad or the status quo, you know, we're seeing a lot of tidy and unbalanced stuff now in college. I mean, you're seeing a lot of things move around a lot and that's because, you know, I think some kids haven't ever seen it and it's hard to line up to, you know? So there is some, there is some valid points to, to what everybody is running and just appreciate it for the art that it is inside the game of football. And uh, you ain't got to be a hater because somebody does something you don't like, you know, appreciate their value and their ability to coach. Yeah, I always, I always said if I was a wing T team and I had a kid that could come in and sling it and I had some speed, and I'm like, okay, we're going to pass it more this year. I yeah. would go straight to a guy that was throwing the ball and say, hey, what's your read on this? How would you do this? Could you help me out? And vice versa. What if you come in with some big linemen, a good running back, an H back, and you're like, you know what? I'm going to run Brent Deerman's stuff. Yeah, and yeah his stuff go- is great. Yeah, and I'm like, I'm gonna look at his stuff. I might go to a run team and be like, okay, how do you block this? How do you block this? But instead, we want to attack each other. I'm like, that's not what we should be doing right now. But what do I know? I'm just an O line coach. I only yeah. coach O line. That's the best way. But I only coach O line. Yeah. That's all I know. Yeah. But yeah, but like Brent, I love Brent Brent Dearman stuff. It's really good. It's it's a good top to bottom system. And it married well together. I mean, everything is married together. It's flawless. I saw him speak at the uh, Alabama Spread Clinic two, maybe two, three years ago when I spoke down there. And there's probably – I've been to a lot of Nike clinics and clinics, and there's two offensive coordinators um, that my pen has smoked from in the last five or six years, and he was one of them. Even though I knew I was – you know, that's not something that we necessarily did. When he started speaking, I realized – this guy's got it together and it is a seamless offense. It he's got all the checks and balances nailed. He knows exactly what he wants his kids to do, how they want to read it and how they, how they execute it. And that's, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's something that intrigues me. And I mean, I sit there and wrote, I mean, my rocket book was smoking when I was writing it down. And then, you know, about five or six, seven years ago up at the Nike clinic in Pittsburgh, I, I drove up there and, um, uh, the guy that was at Penn State, uh, he came to Penn State as the offensive coordinator from Fordham, and then he was he was a he was the coach at Mississippi State before Leach took over. Uh, his name has slipped my, my mind. It's terrible. Um, uh, he, he was he was he come in from Fordham to Penn State with uh, when what's his name from Vanderbilt got hired. James Franklin got hired up there. And he had just got to Penn State when he spoke. He hadn't even – he was still showing Fordham film. And it was unreal. He talked about red zone. He talked about 25 in red zone uh, uh, offense. And the minute he started smoking, my my legal pad, I promise you, I filled up five pages of diagrams and, and, and six font notes I was writing because it was that intriguing for me to – to to listen to because he had all these checks and balances and they weren't outlandish things. It was, it was, he broke it down so simple in the approach that 
I could have took it back to high school and installed it. My kids could have done it. And, and that was the thing I loved about it, that he just didn't have a play. He had broke down the game, the chess match inside the game. And that's, you know, when I heard Deerman speak, I was like, you know, it wasn't long after, I think maybe, you know, he was on his way to Kansas, but maybe I think he might've been hired when he spoke there. He had just gotten hired or vice versa. But uh, those are two guys that just hearing them at clinics, just really, really, uh, really jumped off the page for me because they had that seamless attack to their offense. I mean, it was just seamless. Uh, was it uh, Moorhead? Was that his name? Moorhead. Yes, it. Yes, it. It was Moorhead. I was just going to try to look it up because I didn't want to not have his name, and that's terrible. Sometimes I forget names, but yeah, Moorhead, he was great. I mean, he had just come away from Fordham and got hired at Penn State, and he was speaking up there because we was in Pennsylvania, and he he was he was great. He was great. Um, no, when Brent Deering came out with this book years ago and he was at Arkansas Tech, he it's only on Apple. So, like, he posted it, and I don't have Apple besides an iPad at the time. And I remember I sent him a message just randomly. I was like, Coach, I that book looks great. When it's in the budget, I'm going to get it. About 10 minutes later, hey, Coach, what's your email? And I gave him my email. Two minutes later, it's in my email. He goes, don't tell my wife. There you go. And I still have it. My iPad is old. This was years ago. And the only reason why I keep that iPad is because of that's on there. Yeah. And then ever since then, I was like, I have to find him. And then the summer with the Zoom stuff, every time he did a Zoom, I was on there. And he explains it so well and so simple that I loved. And the thing that I loved about his was he makes sure D gap to D gap or whatever is protected at all times. He doesn't like somebody screaming off and this is what they do. And I'm like, this is simple. Yep. It is. <laughs> and that's what I always look at is that how simple is it and seamless. And that's the, that's the things I got from those guys. And I'm like, this, this is what you want out of an offense. You want to have that checks and balances answered. And you want to you want to have a seamless approach that they can't tip off. Well, when you know, if they get in, that that's my big thing about expansion and contraction. If, if you're a team that's a if you're a team that's you know a power team, and then all of a sudden you go into empty, and all you do is two or three things out of empty, I've got your tendencies pegged, you know. But if you do a pretty good lot out of both, well, it's tough, you know. And and always I kind of like you know. Sometimes you can just out, you know, sometimes the Jimmy's better than the Joe and you can just line up and do that. And the matchup's great. But, you know, at the same time, sometimes you've got, you know, pretty well even matched football teams and you've really got to play a calculated game and having those answers like, you know, Deerman's gotten his offense and Moorhead had when I heard him speak. You, you want that. You know, you want to have that in your back pocket for those days. And people are saying he's not very good at Kansas. I'm like, they just don't have the horses. They just don't yeah. have you got to give it some time. I mean, how many people has won at Kansas, you know, going back, there's been very few, but at the same time, I think that's a great place to start this is because, you know, if he, if he gets a few pieces here and there in there, it's going to change the face of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And I know he knows that, but um, you know, you got to take your opportunities where they come and make the best of them. And, and, you know, and, and roll with it. And so I think, you know, I was kind of excited because I was like, he can he can do some damage there, you know. Yeah, I, I talked him up a little bit to some people and then they weren't winning. They're like, Steve, you don't know nothing. And I was like, just, just wait a minute. Like, they don't have the horses, you know, like give it time. Yeah. Uh, COVID didn't help. So no, it like, didn't. Like It didn't help. And that's the thing that, that people don't understand is that you could really see that the college teams, you could see the teams that were purely talented mm -hmm. and you could see the teams that didn't get as much practice time in. Now, I know as much as you watched, as like I did, you could see, you're seeing it in college basketball right now. Yeah. And, you know, the teams that, de you know, the teams that depend on freshmen every year, like I'm, I'm a big Kentucky basketball fan and have been my whole life. And, you know, they always get five new freshmen every year those guys haven't practiced together all summer and they haven't played together. And, and it,
We're back. There. That was probably my fault. No, it's fine. But, you know, you can see that, you know, the practice time and stuff, you can see it in college football that they hadn't had the practice time. And, you know, that you can see a difference in the younger players. And, you know, as the, as the season wore on, you, you've seen people develop. But we get back to what we were talking about earlier. When you take practice time away, some of these kids leaving high school and going to college, that's a big step to get ready to play at that next level. Mm-hmm. And so, you know. Yeah, it's it's tough, but I think I think he's got I think he's got time at Kansas, and I think that I think that they're going to uh, they're going to they're going to hurt some people's feelings. And that's why I'm kind of worried about high school too. Like, <clears throat> not saying we need all this time, but like when you guys get back, or if we go back, it's two weeks or so. Yeah. And Coach Mackey said it best to me on the I'm on the on the podcast. He goes, "Whatever you guys just ever wanted to do, just get weird. Just put something in you've never done before." Yeah, like just 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 try it. It's the truth, and that's one of the things that I love about the air raid is that we get ten days before we have our first scrimmage, and we get fourteen total practices before we play our first game. Well, on that three day install, I can install that offense three times before we play the first game, uh, before we scrimmage the first time, and you know you don't have all the bugs and and everything worked out, but. If you've installed it three times, you're getting pretty good and your timing is starting to get really good. And we can do that inside the time frame we're given. And I think that gets back to kind of what we talked about earlier about having some type of system offense or defense that you can put in and get installed and get it down. And that way you can really start working on fine tuning everything. So, you know, like you said, with this shortened practice time for us, you know, usually in the, in the summertime, you're kind of getting out there throwing routes and, and doing individual drills with linemen and things. And now we're going to throw all that into basically 14 days before the lights come on. Um, There's going to be a difference. And I think, you know, where we've been in this now since 2015, our kids have played in it, even at the JV level. So that kind of gives us a, that kind of gives us a slight advantage on, we don't really have to reintroduce anything. We just kind of have to, you know, clear the cobwebs a little bit and, and get them running around. And what's good about air raid, like I've never been in a pure air raid. I've been on teams where we've had dabbles of those plays, you know, Mm -hmm. but what's good about me, I don't know as much as you and other people looking at it for myself. You can keep it simple for this situation. And the only change you'll make is one tag. And it's usually a post or like a dig Mm -hmm. and that's it. So with this COVID year, it's like, guess what? We can take six plays maybe and be good. And then as the year goes on, you just have that tag and then you're able to tweak it a little bit. Just it's it's like almost a perfect offense for the situation. Yeah, it, it is exactly right. And you know, finding that stuff that you're good at and those plays that you're really good at and hanging with them and just creating the the tag that conflicts defenders and and let it rip. You know, that's coming out of timeouts and things or getting in games when you you know, the first thing we faced when we first put this in, we didn't know what we were going to get defensively. Um, cause nobody else in our league done this. And, and, you know, if you threw more than 12 times a game in our league at that point in time, you were really slinging it. And, uh, we, we would watch film and they, we had no like opponents running our stuff or anything. And so we would go into games saying, well, we don't really know what we're going to get, just run the play no matter what. And in the game, we'll tag some stuff to, you know, throw the ball down the field or, or combat what they're trying to do. If it's any different. And we would practice basically, you know, two or three coverages a week and 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 go from there and get into games sometimes. And, you know, in the first year, we played some teams that I, I couldn't tell you what they were doing. I, I just I couldn't find a rhyme or reason of what they were doing on the back end. And I, I don't think they were running set or divorce coverages. I think they were just trying to confuse us and confuse the quarterback. And, you know, we stayed true to our reads and. And, you know, we're able to win football games. But that was the hardest thing that first year is, okay, how are people going to treat us? Because we were treated like – just like we used to play another team when I was a defensive coordinator. We played a team that was a double tight, double wing football team, and they were great at it. And then they were a single wing, a really old school, like true blue Pop Warner single wing team, and they were good at it. Well, you had to practice for that thing, you know, and you had to get ready for it. And, uh, you know, 
people treated it like an anomaly. You got defense of the week, you know, because you weren't like anybody else that you were playing. And so our first year in the raid, we got a lot of defense of the week. You know, we got the blitzes. We got the, we got the, well, we're going to drop eight and make you run it. And, and, you know, we got a little bit of everything. And so um, that's one of the things, you know, you kind of, you kind of have to get used to and get ready for, but the tags, you know, lent itself to very easy adjustments in the game versus having to retool something all the way. That's why you can have so minimal plays. And when you tag it, that's another play, but it's not because it's maybe one person doing something different. Yeah. So it, it, it could be a whole new play, but it's better yeah. to do that than say, let's go in with 15 concepts and then let's tag them. The 30 yeah. range and the 40 range. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the thing that tag makes a lot of things look different on film too when you're breaking it down on huddle. Well, they ran that, but then they're here and they got this route going with it. And this, and you know, it, it looks different. And so the playbook grows for the people that are breaking us down and having to practice against us. And, you know, we really didn't change nothing. We might not even use that tag this week if we don't have to. So, you know, it gets some chasing ghosts too, which lends it back to what we talk about the wing T and those type of offenses. They want you to chase ghosts and make that make that practice week tough and have you cover everything and not get a lot of reps at covering it. And that's the tough part about defending those guys each week. Just yeah. practice against that offense without a football. Yeah, exactly. That's how we used to do the option. We practiced our football and we had our, you had to get your responsibility. Yeah, that's exactly what we done. Or we just made the quarterback hold a tennis ball before to where they couldn't even see the football. Just I don't know why the quarterback could hold on to something. But like yeah. you couldn't see it, so that's because I used to coach defense too, and that was one of the things was, well, how could we practice this? And we all were like, why don't you just don't use a football? Yeah, now they're not looking at the guy; they're looking at their. Oh, I'm responsible for the quarterback. That's all I'm looking at. Yep. If that guy motions this way, well, this guy's responsible. Don't worry about it. Don't be looking. Yep. But um, now I I remember you and Coach Piscopo got to go see Mike Leach's practice at Washington State. I was yes. a fanboy. When you guys post, I was like, oh, my God, I'm jealous. Like, I was just like, oh, how was yeah. that? Like, how did you guys come across to do that? Does he let, let anybody do that, or do you have to, like, schedule it? Or Well, um, uh, Drew actually called. Uh, he called, and and it was their first three days of spring practice. And uh, could could we come in and, uh, you know, watch him practice for two or three days and then fly back and – and um, he called me and he said, uh, you know, I'm fixing to make this cross country trip. And would you like to go with me? I don't have anybody go with me. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I'd never been on a plane that long, but I was like, yeah, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Um, I can check another, uh, you know, meet one of my coaching heroes. I can check him off the list. And, and so we went out there and, and spent three days and, and, you know, and got to sit in and watch practice and, and coaches meetings and, and things of that nature. And, you know, what it sold for me is exactly what we've been talking about. You know, there was no bells and whistles at practice. Uh, there was no widgets and gadgets. Um, it, I don't want to, I don't want to like devalue what I saw. What I saw um, from a football coach's standpoint was a production line. And it was products, you know, the players are products coming down a production line and how, and the coaches were, how can I, you know, what little inspection am I looking for to make sure this product is the best it can be, you know, inside the drills we're going to do every day when the kid gets good at foot firing, you know, how good are his hands on release? And so we've got foot firing down, but his hands, are, we got to work the hands, you know, uh, offensive lineman, you know, he's got his steps down. How is his punch? And, you know, how is his posture and, and, you know, his balance. And it was every day of refining the, the weaknesses in the product. And, you know, you see jump ropes, you know, saw lineman jumping rope. You know, everybody's always talking about every lineman jump rope. They jumped the lineman, offensive lineman jump rope for three minutes each day. And the whole point about it was, and a lot of people are like, well, that's just dumb. It was a way to work agility. And it was a way to, you know, get them to pick their feet up. And, you know, and have some hand movement at the same time. And, you know, but they done six point explosion. They done four point explosion with linemen working hips and firing hands. They done, you know, um, 
they they done special teams like we would in high school. Uh, they had team time. Um, they it, it looked like a practice that we could go back and put in. But at the same time, the biggest thing that was a turning thing is they do this every day. They do it the same way every day. And their coaches are focusing on the tidbits to get them better. They are looking for the minute flaws to get a kid better. So they're, you know, because they've got the basis down and they do it every day, they can teach kids at a higher level because they're honing their skills at a higher level and because of how simplistic things are. And so that's how they're able to, to match, you know, teams that may not match up with them very well, you know, and, with a talent wise and that, that when I came back, I said this, I said, this is drill on the flight. And he and I agreed both. I was like, I'm a high school football coach that coaches this offense. And I'm a lot more complicated than he is. <laughs> As you guys know, the coach Steve show is also brought to you by the unhinged sports network. The unhinged sports network is a 24 hour, seven days a week, nonstop playing uh radio podcast about any sport that you guys can imagine. They have a proud partnership with Fanatics. So if you go to the link in the description, uh, go to Fanatics, use that link, and go get some gear to support the Coach Steve Show and to support the Unhinged Sports Network. They have deals all the way up to 70% off. They have deals for free shipping. And they have every single sports team you could think of. Your college team is going to be on there. Your professional team is going to be on there. They have good deals on jerseys, T-shirts, hats, socks, anything you want. So please use the link in the description to go to fanatics.com. Save big on your team's gear to help support the un- support the Unhinged Sports Network and to support the Coach Steve <laughs> show. I'm a lot more complicated. And so when we came back, I restructured everything I done. And basically said, do I really need this drill? Do I really need to do this? You know, how does this fit? Am I just doing this because I picked it up or is it? you know, does, is it streamlined with what we're doing? And, you know, that's the, that's the idea I got behind it. What, you know, brilliant guy could be a fortune 500 <laughs> business, business owner because he looks at football. Um, you know, this is my three day synopsis. He looks at football like a engineer looks at a process you know, and he he wants to watch film and he wants to break down the positions, the releases and everything else, everything that everybody's doing. He's like, we got to work on that. We got to work on that. We got. And, you know, they're making their practice plan for the next day for each drill. We got to work on that in this drill. You know, and we got to we got to get better at this. And this is real sloppy right now. And and it wasn't just to say it. He it was something that I was like, you know, uh, I really need to go back and say, you know, I'm just going to refine the process and slim it down as we always say, you know, slim it down as much as I can. The most expensive things in the world and the most people that have profited the most off things is the most simplest things. Mm-hmm. And when you make life simpler or easier, uh, that's kind of, that's kind of that, you know, but, but I kind of think that that's one of the things he I took away from the trip is that I'm way more complicated. I need to simplify. And this is how I'm going to do it. Yeah, I keep bringing up Coach Mackey because he's told me a lot. He's like, go read that A20 principle book. You know, like 80 percent of what we our success is 20 percent of what we do. And I was like, oh, my goodness. Like, that's true. I read it. And I was like, we need to be more simple. Like me as an online coach, I was like, do I need to do all these drills or can I figure out this drill that works everything? Or do I need six drills or can I do it with three? And figure that yeah. out. And it's funny you said that we're more complicated than Mike Leach. That's not good because he's way smarter than me. And I yes, I mean, that, that, that's the thing I realize is like, I'm not even on the same level because I don't really understand how to simplify this even more. Because I think it's simple, but it's I, I'm I, by me thinking it's simple. I'm making it more complex. Uh huh. And you know you can't be paranoid and worry about stuff. Just go out there and do what you do every day and get better at it, and execute. 
Yeah, I think yeah, it's I, know not, I know that's not the picture everybody wants painted. Right. But that's really really what it boils down to. Well, I mean, it just it helps with that thing of because I remember when he got hired at Washington State, even the players were like, Well, he, when he came in, I thought it was gonna be this complicated air raid, and the players even said his first year, like, this isn't complicated. Mm-hmm. Like what we do is not hard. Um I think it just helps reinforce that he's so simple and that's why no he'll he won't change. Like yeah. uh, you probably heard it. I have people ask me because I'm a they know I'm a big Mike Leach fan. And they're like, Well, he just run the ball this year. Look at what's happening. And I'm like, that's not what he does. That's not what they practice. He's not gonna throw it out to add this. He's not gonna throw something out to say, let's run power now every play. He's not that's yeah. not what he does. And it just goes back to being simple. Like it's just not gonna no, that's that's on my bucket list is drive my happy ass down to Mississippi State and be like, hey, I'm here. I want yeah, to even, <laughs> even if you went down to their coach's clinic at spring ball, it would really be worth it to watch practice. Just just because and I don't care what offense you run. When you when you see it, when you see it from that uh when you see it from that perspective, you kind of you kind of say, hey, that you know, this could be this could be a whole lot simpler, and I'm way overthinking it. And I don't necessarily need that widget and gadget that everybody's selling on 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 social media to make me better. Probably the probably the coach. I, I'll say this: I probably the most best piece of equipment I've seen that maybe all high schools don't have. And they didn't use it a ton because they wanted their quarterbacks throwing. They had a jugs machine. I mean, they had a jugs machine. And you know, some high schools don't even have that. We don't have a jugs machine. But as far as fancy stuff, and, and that's not to devalue. It <laughs> kind of goes back to, you know, how much of this stuff do we really need out of these magazines and catalogs? Not saying that people don't find great use for them. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that, you know, sometimes we get mesmerized and uh, we think that adding on is more when really less is more. Mm-hmm. And so that's kind of, that's kind of the deal there. I, I was really, and I was, I'll tell you something, other thing, the number one thing that kind of disbunks the myth, it was a very physical practice. It was a very, their inside run period was physical. And I, I've been to Clemson's, and it was just as physical. You know, I have been, and and that's you know that's not physical; it's physical. Um, he would be a great war general. I mean, he he uh, he just things. Are, it was physical. It was physical on the pass drops. The the pass sets were physical, and and they, you know, the receiver play blocking on the perimeter was physical. And so you know, you kind of can kind of can uh, kill that debunk that myth too. When you watch that practice, it was as old school of a practice as if we would have went to a Bear Bryant practice in the seventies. I mean, it, it, when I say that, it was it was concentrated on the game of football. There was there was no lights and shows and music playing, and I, I'm not against that, but there wasn't there wasn't this carnival feel to it. It was football practice, and right. and and both people use you know different coaches use that for. For different, and if you're reaching kids, that's all that matters because that's what we're trying to do. But he was as old school as any old school hard nosed coach I'd seen as far as his, as what they'd done at practice. Now, his approach and demeanor didn't change. He was, you know, an even kill guy that, you know, demanded production. But, you know, they, they got after it. And so that so was I, one of the great things about it. Yes. Yeah, so when I see next time on Twitter that they're soft. I was like, why don't you go watch one of his practices? I'll just respond to him. I go, why don't you go watch his practice then? Yeah. I have the source. Coach Taylor told me, you need to go watch, and you'll find out that it's not soft. And we think pass setting is, is, is passive, and it's not. I mean, it's it's a it's a barroom brawl. I, I tell our players, I was like, when you pass it, it's a barroom brawl. It's you and that man 40 times a night. Whoever's walking out with the least dirt on them is winning this thing. And I said, you know, go to the ground with him if you got to, but you gotta you gotta beat that man 40 times a night. You know, this is your wrestling match right over here. There's five wrestling matches going on. 
Mm-hmm. You know, we need four out of five pins. <laughs> right. You know, and maybe a submission, but <laughs> it, it, that's kind of what it boils down to. But yeah, that was that helped me as a coach. Um, and I spent a, a weekend with Coach Mummy and, and we talked on the phone. But, you know, being able to go to a live practice at a college and see the pure that the pure version of that ran and see that, you know, I as a high school coach am way more complicated than he is. And that was, you know, that was a telltale sign. Well, I think I know from my perspective, coaching high school, we're simple at first. And then, like you said, we start to worry about, well, for the next year, like, well, what if they do this? We have to have this or and then we fall. In, I don't. I, I try not to. We fall in that trap of, "Well, I saw this on Saturday. Let's let's try this." And I think that's where we get in trouble, where we're so worried about we need to have more if then situations because they're going to stop this, and that's where we get complicated. Football football coaches are the most paranoid people on the planet. Mm-hmm. They are. And we we are we are world we are our own worst enemies about overthinking things. And, and we're all superstitious. And That's exactly. Nice. I mean, we're worse than baseball players on superstition. <laughs> and, you know, and the the thing about it is, is I don't really worry about that. You know, I'm like you when I'm watching film, how good are they up front? How good are they on the back end? What are they trying to employ on the defense? How can I get the numbers in my advantage? What formation gives them trouble? You know, um, who can, you know, who can we manipulate based on this coverage with a tag? And guess what, guys? We're going to run the same plays over and over again against this, and we're going to get good at them, and you're, it's going to be a reaction. Uh, the thought's going to become a reaction, and, you know, the thinking process is going to be reactive instead of a, a educated guess. Yeah. And so, that's you know, that's the, that's, that's the long and short of the, the ticket and the secret behind it. It's how you practice. Yeah, Wade Phillips said this about his defense, which uh, it kind of transfers to offense. Your players play faster when they know what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, so, one, one, of, one of the first coaches I ever coached with told me, and he had been a coach for a long time, he said, don't do anything to slow your players down. Mm-hmm. Whatever it is, don't do it. He said, because if they're standing thinking, they're not moving and they're not making a play. And he was a defensive coach, and he's like, whatever it is, don't do it. I don't care how great it is. Don't do it. If it slows him down, don't do it. And he's, I mean, the more I look at it back now, uh, several years, he's right. I mean, there's a lot of good plays that we've had come in. Like how many times can we rep it? How does it fit into what we're doing? And it's not that it's a bad play. Put that in the card catalog, Mm -hmm. but it really don't fit what we're doing this year. And it really doesn't, but I don't want to throw it away. Great thought and great, I mean, great play, but it doesn't it doesn't fit what we're doing. Um, but we need to keep it. We need to keep it somewhere in mind because one day we might be sitting here and say, you know, when I think about it, and it might be something we can use. And that's the thing. I, I don't want us. I don't want us to slow down. It's like we were talking about it, that tight front. I bet week. I bet in conference we were in some form of empty. probably 60% of the time. We did not start out the year to be an empty football team. Mm -hmm. It was a way to combat that tight front and make them change the coverage, find a matchup. But it was comfortable for us because we already had empty in, and it doesn't change the plays we're running. It just puts the running back in a different slot that may make the defense have to change their coverage because of the look. And so we ended up in some type of empty a lot and leaving the quarterback in a five man box to throw it and or to run. And so it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a big change for us. And so we had a whole offense built out of empty, <laughs> you know, but it didn't change anything we were doing. Right. And it goes back to being simple. Can you yeah. be simple enough to where you can run everything out of anything and yeah. make it look different? Yeah. And like you said, we, you football is easy. We make it complicated. Yeah, we do. And and that's that's one of the things that I have to back off from sometimes watching games. Watch it as a fan and enjoy it and respect the art 
of it and the devotion the coaches put into it, you know, and, 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 you know, and enjoy that part of it instead of trying to dissect everything and get paranoid, you know? Yeah. You just, you, you can keep some things like you said in your back pocket. Like I had looked into ISO years ago, but I never coached it. Never where I, wherever I had been, I've, I was an OC, never did it. I've been an online coach. They never had it, wanted it, but guess what? I've had it. This year, guess what? One of the first things they said was, "We're gonna run ISO." I pulled it out of my back pocket. I was like, "There we go. Now we now I can do this." I had it in my yeah. had my tool belt somewhere, and I was like, "Hold on, let me get it out." Here it is. Now I can coach it. Exactly, and and that's the beauty of it. I I listen to as many people as I can speak, no matter what they're doing, because they might have a better way of doing what I'm doing, and and executing it better and i don't have to change anything just change maybe a drill or a uh something we were having problems with and i don't have to you know forfeit the whole thing or like you said there's been years we could run wide cross to a t there's been years where we didn't have the personnel to run wide cross so we ran h cross because the h could do it and the y couldn't Mm -hmm. there's been years we've been good at mesh there's been years we aren't i don't worry about it if we can't run it you know, we, we're going to run inside the offense what we're good at and make it as adaptable as we can. And I don't sit there and just – I don't put a square peg through a round hole. There are some kids that could that could do it. There were some years we were better at four verticals. And, I mean, that's that's just the long and short of it and find the stuff and pull it down and get better at it. So, I mean, that's, that's really it. Yeah, but as long as it's in your tool belt and you can pull it out later on if you need to and put the other tool back in, we're good to go. Yep. And as long as it's there, not saying you have to install it, that's where we get in trouble is if I have it in my tool belt, let's install it. That's where yep. we get in trouble. And yep. as, as long as we learn to keep the tool belt, the tools on the tool belt, pull it out when we need to, put the other one back. Then the next year, maybe we need it. The ne- next house we build that next year, we can pull it back out. That's yeah. my country. I grew up in, in the cornfield, so that's my cornfield talk coming up. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Coach, I took a lot of your time. I really appreciate just talking ball, just talking everything. Like, Coach, I, pre- I appreciate you having me on, man. I, I love listening to podcasts, and, and I, I love uh, being able to talk ball and meet new people and 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 understand you know some of the things they're going through in their area of the world and everything. And I appreciate what you're doing and so many other coaches are doing to, to interview and talk to coaches and, and give us a form of a tool of learning and, and getting to know people. It's, it's big, especially during these times, and I do appreciate it. Yeah, it's free therapy is what I call it. Yes, sir. And I need to start charging people maybe like five bucks an hour. I, mean, I would have made some money by now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the truth. No, well, I, I'll root for you guys. I'm glad you're getting it. Yes, I'm jealous of people playing, but I'm glad to hear how many people are playing. I'm like, thank goodness people are playing. Like, I'm so happy for you guys and your kids that you're able to play and go out and do that. And I, I live vicariously through you guys. Like, they're coaching. I have to keep up on it. Like I have to see what they're doing. Yeah. So yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll root for it's you guys. Cool. Hmm? I'll root for you guys here in the spring. I'm holding out hope, Coach. Y'all get to play. Y'all get to play. Oh, I, my heart is hoping for it, so we'll see. It may not be February. Maybe it's March, and that's fine with me. It's a little warmer. It's a little warmer. Yeah, we'll just have rain. That's the thing with Illinois. It's snow, and then we get to March, and it's like, because I coach track, too. It's like, it's rain the whole time. Yeah, it's the same way here. It's the same way here. But guess what? I won't care. I will not care. I'll slide in the mud. I'll be like, we're back. Yeah, I love it because that's the thing. I, I've missed it, and I'm ready to walk out on that field and and uh, and and be around those kids. And, and the, I don't, you know, even if the atmosphere is different, just to be able to get out there and do it again is going to be fun. Yep. Well, I appreciate you. Um, anybody out there listening? Wear the mask, stay safe so we can get back to life, please. And thanks, everyone, for listening.